before uh, we get going on the topic of the day, um, I know we're all very shocked and saddened by the sudden passing of Frank Walton, who was of course a president, past president of this society. He was very well known to all of you. And he was the reason why London 2022 actually happened. Um, and I think it's appropriate that everybody, um, well, we have, a, we have a minute's silence just to think about him and his family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's one other um, topic that I'd like to address before we get round to introducing Stuart, and that is if uh, if Chris King can unmute himself, he wanted to make um, an announcement about the Crawford Festival. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, on the 27th and 28th of June, we're going to have um, a full two-day event at 15 Ab Church Lane, which is called the Crawford Festival. And on the final night, we will award the, uh, the Crawford Medal for um, the year's 2020 and 2021 um, but during the course of the two days we're going to be looking at how one produces a philatelic book um, and uh, everything that goes around that so um, if you're interested in philatelic publishing you're interested in potentially writing a book you've got a book which is already underway or you're simply a, a, a bibliophile um, we'd love to hear from you. I shall be sending out a note about this to publishers today um, and to others over the course of the next few days. So uh, please watch this space. Please come and join us uh, at the Crawford Festival um, on the 27th and 28th of June. And um, we look forward to seeing you there. So thanks very much indeed, Mike. Sorry, I, I thought it was 28, 29. Is it? I, 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 Mike got Mike got in there before me, and I didn't have my piece of paper in front of me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's right. Tuesday, Tuesday and it's Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. Um, I was just about to print it out, so then Mike called me. Twenty eighth, twenty ninth. Yeah. So sorry about that. Twenty eighth and 29th, Tuesday and Wednesday, the day before, the two days before the mm -hmm. eight pm. Okay. Well, thank you for for that, gentlemen. Um, I now return to the topic of the day because um, I don't know Stuart very well um, but he has described himself to me as a philatelic dabbler um, someone who likes to start new collections when it takes his fancy but he's never quite sure when um, other collections he's uh, he's had include the large Hermes heads of Greece Italian states and the skilling issues of Norway. He's compiled and published a two volume, 900 page full color catalog of exhibition and event poster stamps because of his massive interest in Cinderella's. 
So today's uh, related subject, we await with interest. This is something that I've seen uh, displayed at Stampex. Although despite that, um, I can't remember which category it was in, but there we are. Stuart, over to you. Okay, well, that's, that's the topic. Um, before I start, I should pay homage to Art Groton, who is on the call today, because he was the man who got me interested in this. And we did collaborate on that uh, catalogue that Mike mentioned. And Art is very much a pioneer in things unusual in philately, well known for it. But all credit goes to him for bringing me into this uh, topic. And he'll recognise quite a few of the items in this. They used to belong to him. So this topic, a few years ago, wouldn't really have been considered particularly important in terms of postal history, postal reforms. But I think nowadays it's much more accepted as quite, quite interesting and important. And I'll leave you to judge at the end if you also think it's important. So that's the topic. <clears throat> Why am I doing it? <clears throat> well, the 1839 postal reforms, one of the main aims was to get cheap postage. It dropped the unit to the uniform penny post in January 1840. But they've configured at that time that the volume might increase fourfold of mail. And I think obviously they've planned their finances accordingly and the, the success of it. But the volume didn't reach that number until about 1847. So I think there had to be some ways of getting the volume of letters up. And that's what this is about, things that complement the, the reforms. And in yellow here, you see four topics there that I think were quite important. One was to get a better method in wax seals for securing letters. They're very messy. And unless you had a, a servant or you were used to it as a business, very difficult to think for the general public to use the system. So this wafer seal was developed, which obviated the need for the, the wax seal. And those wafer seals were used by the public and businesses to get messages to people to publicize their business, make a message, or promote a social or a political uh, movement they have involved in. Uh, and I encourage, I encourage letter writing that way. We also had to get the development of a self sealing envelope in commercial quantities. They weren't at the early days. They were, they were handmade and not, not, not gummed. But that came about 1851 on the Great Exhibition. So that was an important advance. And also in part level, uh, attractive writing paper and envelopes were developed because of the techniques from then made available to do, to make letter writing much more enjoyable. So all of these helped to increase the numbers and made the reduced postal rate economic. So I've structured the talk in those sort of these of areas. And the first part is really a bit of a history lesson rather than philatelic history. It's about the origins of camera impression seals, which the first type of seal that was used. A very temporary thing that worked very well, and it then went on to the wafer seal. But the origins were coming from the grand tour that people went on in the 18th century and the early 19th century. <clears throat> then we look at types of wafer seals. There are a number of them, ways, ways of making a wafer seal. It could be paper, it could be hissing glass, it could be all sorts of things. And there were connections outside of the Great Britain, because although there's topics about GB postal reform, there is an Italian-German use connection to talk about. That's why I talk about them, because of the importance to, to support this Great British uh, reform. Topics on the way for sales. Um, people chose eventually to send messages on the sales, either sentimental ones with Valentine's, or their name, or the day of the week it was sent, and also to support social causes and protests. And they're very important to see. <clears throat> and give you a very good insight into the Victorian times looking at them. Then when patent envelopes were developed from the 1840s onwards, they did exist the envelopes before that, but not in, in, in really useful forms. And it began to be patented in uh, 1840s onwards. And ultimately, the Great Exhibition, you got machines available to fold paper, gum them and emboss them and shoot them out in commercial quantities. And that really was a boon and obviated the need for the wafer sale at that point. And also at the exhibition, you get nice decorative envelopes and writing paper. 
So that's the, the sections I'm going to talk about. Uh, let's talk a bit about wafer seals, sorry, uh, wax seals first of all. I mean, the wax seals were applied using this sort of matrix, which usually has a handle with a matrix on here, or a ring. And when you got one, and you got one from the engraver, you got a little proof copy in a box. Seal in there, the, the, the impression, and the advertisement for the engraver on here. And that was commonly done when you got a, a new wafer seal. It's a nice example of a wafer seal. It's, a, it's an hourglass with wings on it. And it's very appropriate because the letter has got a, an Edinburgh time stamp on it here on the, on the right, bottom right hand side. Now there was a, an initiative to try and make a better matrix than the one that exists. They're normally done in uh, brass or in uh, hard stone. But this chap, Mr. Lewis in, in Ireland, developed this imp improved composition seal. Not much is known about it. There are some references in some of the art journals in 1839-40 in Ireland. And this, this flyer, which talks about the ones he could produce to give a better impression. And the only examples we have to date are these proof examples of this one item here of a dog sitting on a tomb. I can't find any other ones. I have looked for them quite strongly. I can't find any more, but they probably do exist. But they are very fragile, so they probably don't exist in great quantities. So that was a, an attempt to make it better using wafer, using wax. And you saw that earlier in the introduction, there's a wax seal, and that's what a wafer seal looks like. That's a, 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 a paper one, embossed paper. Quick summary of the types of wax seals. Wax seals are seen. Then you get these cameo impression seals, and as the words imply, based on cameos. But, uh, of different types which were commonly used and brought back from the great uh, Grand Tour of Italy and France and uh, very cultural places during that period of time in the 19th, 18th and early 19th century. And you get these camera impression seals which attempted to be used to seal envelopes were very brittle and didn't work very well so it didn't last long, not many are known. The main types of wafer seals and the classes of wafer seals now uh, these in glass ones, which is a thin form of mica, or paper ones, which can be embossed or plain or either surfaced in different styles. So that's a quick summary of types of wafer seals. So the history lesson. <laughs> it, when people went on the Grand Tour, if you were rich or you were nobility, they went round uh, parts of the Europe, and mainly Italy was the place they went to, to get some culture. And they like to bring back mementos from the Grand Tour. And one of the common things they brought back were cameos, which were precious stones or semi-precious stones or hard stones or sometimes shells engraved with uh, scenes from antiquity to remind them of what went on. So they bring them back as a memento. But the problem with that was these were expensive and there was only one of them. So very enterprising people and some of the engravers Two of the British ones, uh, Nathaniel Marchant and Edward Birch, produced copies of the, 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 way of the uh, seal by making a mould and from the mould putting plaster in it, either white or a sort of reddish uh, sulfurous one, and making these impressions here. So these are cameo impressions in plaster. And you also get them, you get them in this book form, because this chap, Liberati, in Italy, decided to make up books of them from different impressions from different museums. And this is double sided, so these cameras on two sides, camera impression two sides. And there's a list here, numbered, numbered against these, with the topic, the museum it came from, or collection it came from, and sometimes, usefully, the engraver. You also got these from Victorian times. People had them as little poorly framed uh, things on the wall. Not very good impressions. And this is for the poorer people had these usually as a memento of, uh, of uh, cultural things and showing their cultural credentials. So that's what cameo impressions look like of that form. But they weren't going to be useful as a seal until we get this. Uh, uh, Evolution. Here's the original camera here, 
His final annual march, who was uh, British, who went to Italy to learn that his trade a lot there, did a lot of work out there. And he came back to the UK and was an engraver at the Royal Mint and Stamp Office and worked with William Lyon at that time. That's one of his. Bruce in 1780, gifted to the museum, British Museum, but it was destroyed in 18, 1941, so it doesn't exist. But it was, it did have his name at the bottom. Some engravers added their initials of the signature. And his unplastered impression of it, which I have in one of those books that you should have previously, of that cameo. And I also have a gum mixed impression cameo, a thinner one, which is the one that was used as a, a letter seal with the same impression on it. So this evolved by that way. Really. And Nathaniel Marshall did them himself because he produced a catalogue of these in 1795. Don't know who produced these ones, possibly him or possibly De Barotti, who did the books and did it from impressions he got from museums. But that's the evolution from the original cameo to what we call cameo impressions used on seals of letters. Here's some more examples of cameo impressions of those uh, thin ones. And these were made by not having a mold, but by putting a thin gum mixer across the cameo, wiping it clean, but leaving the gum in the impressions on the, on the gem or the semi-precious semi gem. Then putting a thicker mixture of gum with pigment on the top, letting that dry. And when it dried, it shrank a bit and it could be peeled off and you get these beautiful impressions of a cameo. Here's some large ones, that's about three and a half inches high. These were sometimes put on presentation cards for giving to people as gifts. And unusually, this little uh, bracelet with cameo impressions on it. And these are cameo impression seals, or well, not seals, but cameo impressions by Mr. Birch. And these smaller ones were candidates for sealing letters. But not to forget wax seals, they were still around. Uh, and here's a box of samples that. Uh, would be taken around for selling his wares from engraver. And a lot of these are examples, but some of them would be for collectors because they were just uh, scenes of antiquity. And I'm sure they would have been used as uh, mementos as well as actual seals. Now on back to philatelic history, the real history. Here's a cameo impression seal on an entire from 1840, the only one I have. And I know of only two more that have survived. I've seen one of them and I've not seen the other one. They wouldn't have survived much because they're very brittle. That wax that, that, uh, is made of gum and it cracks very easily. But here's a separate example of that one, not an entire. So this was not a very successful way of sealing letters. So that's one of the origins, but there's another origin for wafer seals because these types of seals here were used in the early part of the 19th century and earlier. Here's an advert in an 1814 newspaper for these wafer seals, a list of them in pricing, some examples and samples. And these plain ones were used sometimes to seal entires. Not very common, though. you don't see very many of them around. They're, they're quite scarce. So there's two origins related to the wafer seals. One from antiquity and the uh, Grand Tour, and one from the use on legal and financial documents. Then we go to the Italian connection. And the, the camera impression seals didn't survive because they weren't very useful, they were brittle. What they did then, they moved to paper and similar types of designs, either embossed with uh, metallic surfaces or embossed with color. And these are these are from letters carried by hand, a correspondence of Ducesi de Cordellirano, quite a big case correspondence, quite a lot of that exists, but it shows them used in the 1840s. Here's a nice entire used in 1841 from Florence to, from Florence to Ireland, with three on it, quite unusual, quite pretty seals. Now it's, it's, it's interesting, that I think the early wafer sales like this did come from Italy because it came off from the camera impressions which came from there. Here's another type of uh, simulated camera seal, it's paper but looks like a cameo. 
And this one is Queen Victoria's bust on a decorative envelope carried by hand. Here's Prince Albert bust on a letter sent to the post. Another type of seal was not paper, it was ising glass. This is a very thin form of mica. It was commonly used in America, but not much used in Great Britain. Uh, these, are, these are probably American ones. This is a little lady's envelope with one on it, which is sold towards the envelope. And either had letters on them or small uh, mottos on them. We also got a glass ones manufactured in Germany because they had technology. And this is from a German source. The rissing glass, but much nicer, and they were mainly used in the British for British mail. This is mainly used in America. Here's more of the usage of rissing glass seals, a nice decorative envelope with one on it, a Valentine, the Valentine itself with a couple of seals and the Valentine's envelope with the seal on the seal on the back, sent to the post. Here's one that still sits at the same glass, but it's one of those German ones, and it's sent from Italy to Great Britain, 1841. And here's a German collection. connection. Um, you saw those nice uh, produced seals, and here's a German sample book with about 1,600 seals in it, very big book. Here's one page from it, beautifully done. It really works of art <coughs> because they had the technology at the time and sold them out to Britain and America for use. A different sample book, different types of seals, but the same principles of them. <coughs> and these are all tend to be paper or in some cases, this in glass. There's a few some glass ones that are but mainly paper ones. That's a German connection. So embossed seals used in Britain, nice little in uh, entire with a penny black on it, with an embossed uh, paper seal, black paper seal, sent by Mr. John Waterloo, what uh, latterly became Waterloo and Sons, with a nice famous sender. Already with a nice seal on it there, with a little paper seal with an envelope design with a motto around it, go where I wish to go, wish to be. <coughs> More paper seals, different style. Mainly American, these I think, because these are sentimental ones, are definitely American, and these are probably American. This is how the sheets were done. And you cut them out and you stuck them on the back of your, your envelope or your entire. War paper seals. This one is the earliest one I've been able to find of a paper seal. It's got a, a letter L, and it's in highly surface paper. And it's from December 1836, which I believe is the earliest one known just now. I haven't found an earlier one, uh, but you never know what's out there because these are not widely collected and or discarded and lost. And there must be a lot of them where these around somewhere in dealers' boxes. This is a nice one. It came from India to Scotland. with a nice wafer seal on the back depicting Kelso Abbey. I've got to believe this is probably from a missionary or a churchman in India back to back to home. But it's, it, it, it shows a nice uh, markings from India paid marks through the post. You do get seals that look like seals but aren't. These are false seals, false seals. On the right, this is an envelope produced by Newman in the 1860s. And they actually produced seals like that as well, which we'll see later. But that's just on the flap, it's printed on the flap. This is an unusual one. This is a, an embossed faux seal on the flap with Roland Head's image on it, with free under it. And I think the connection is with the free trade movement, which we'll see later on. These were produced in 1848 and used in Britain and America. And I'm told seven examples are known, including this one I have, which was used in New York. But it's a, a link between the Roland Hill uh, initiatives and the free trade initiatives. Now there are different ways of sealing mail. Um, the ones on the left here had this writing on it proposed as about 1830 and they are very thin pillow paper with gummed on the back. Advertisements, now they could be just used as advertisement, they could be used for sealing mail. Uh, this one is about the Royal Mail's Court Office in Grosvenor Hotel. This is about playing cards. 
And this one on the right demonstrates how correspondence went between Queen Victoria and her ministers. And this is what they call a dispatch note. This wrapper that was put round about the correspondence, and there are holes here where you put through thread or a piece of uh, tape to tie it up together. On the top, you can see it comes from Lord Palmerston, from Lord Palmerston to the Queen, and from the Queen to Palmerston, backwards and forwards. Now, <clears throat> it's not dated, but given it's got a mourning band round about it, it would have come after uh, Prince Albert died. So that probably times it to when Palmerston was the Prime Minister in 1859 to 62. So it's probably 61 or 62 that's dated from. So that's the way the mail went between the Queen and the ministers. The last in this section, this is how the sold seals. Either in a little box, there's a one from Dillaroo, or an envelope has a Dillaroo one as well. And they're really quite pretty, some of these envelopes for selling the seals. And one is designed for weddings, which are probably silver ones. I believe there also are ones for funerals that are dark and black. There's a French one, just for completeness to be a bit European. I'm not directly connected with this, but interesting, I think. This is a, a writing box of cardboard construction from the 1850s. Hunting seals on the, on the lid, and inside you get a nib holder and a nib, a bit of wax, and lots of wafer seals. Now, I can't swear all these seals came with this box, but obviously it was intended to include things like that in these little compartments. So we're going to look at topics on wafer seals because people took the opportunity of putting messages on the seals when they sent the, the, the letters to the post. First, we'll look at topographical ones, which are very popular. Here's Newman again, we mentioned him earlier, one on the back of a sealing a, an envelope. And this is a presentation card with a full set of these ones, the scenes of Great Britain. There's little flowers, embossed flowers, and a quite pretty little presentation card. That's Newman. The other interesting one for that type of seal is Ackerman. So this little envelope would have one of these stuck on the front and the other ones are inside. These are Ackerman seals. These topographical pretty ones show scenes of Grand Great Britain and they're hand tinted. So that must be on a laborious exercise making those and be quite expensive at the time. Another interesting topic would be portraits. This one here on an entire, which I call Famous and Infamous, Infamous, which I'll explain. And it's, it's a seal with the head of Petrach, uh, a scholar and father of humanism. Famous because it featured in a book by Champress and Trapnell about wafer seals, I think the only book that exists on it. And it was believed to be the earliest one in July, 1837, but not now. So I've shown you one in December 1836. Infamous because in the letter he says, I seal this with a specimen of a wafer which I stole from Shandor's house. I don't think it's very wise to put that in writing, but uh, it's a lovely. And two other nice ones, obviously from the same sort of set, one of Lord Byron, one of Shakespeare. Some commercial ones, there were a lot of those around. Um, I like this Pittman's envelope. This is Pittman's phonograph, phonography, phonograph, phonography, which is shorthand. So that's the advertising envelope, and it has one of the Pittman seals on the reverse, made by Mr. Baxter. A number of those exist. This one here is an agent for a, a gun maker to Prince Albert on the back of that one. And this one is Kent Fire Office. And this is interesting. Um, because the insurance companies came out of all of this and had their own fire brigades. And this was probably in that period where they ran their own fire brigades to get rid of fires, didn't have to pay out. This is from the Kent Fire Office. So now we're looking at what's probably the most interesting part of the, the topics, social and political causes. The first one being the Anti-Corn Laws League in the 1840s. And this was the beginning of free trade, promotion of free trade, which Britain led at that point in time. 
uh, and the corn laws were in place to preserve the price of corn for the benefit of landowners and farmers uh, to the cost of the poor. So it was a big campaign uh, to, to get rid of that, that law. And there's a wafer seal, round one. There's another two types which I have, but that's one on a nice uh, already. Signed by Joseph um, Hume, who was a Scottish MP and a radical reformer, and he really campaigned against the anti-trade union laws to get things to happen. Another one here, nice uh, in, uh, already, with this diamond-shaped seal on it. It's upside down just now, but I'll show you what, what it's like in the next one. Uh, to Manchester. Now, Manchester was the centre of this anti-corn laws league at the time. Another two with multiple seals on it, which are pretty rare to have multiple seals. And this is what the diamond one says. And if you remember back to the Roland Hill false seal, this one says, thanks for the cheap postage. May we soon get cheap bread, free communication with all parts of the world is good, but free trade with all parts of the world is even better. So this is Britain pr promoting free trade as they did in the, as part of the, as, of the, of the century and uh, led to its wealth and uh, dominance in that area. Now we get religious ones, very similar to the uh, free trade ones. These are unused ones at the top, and one used on the back of a nice penny black envelope, and other ones with religious sayings on it. And he was selling these, and there was he was selling these uh, wafers for Christians. Well, presumably other people could buy them as well, but uh, I'm sure he didn't intend that. Unfortunately, one of them was a bit damaged on there, but this is a nice item, and so I'm happy to keep it in my collection. More religious ones. Um, I mean, the Victorians were wanted to be uh, very cultured, and a lot of them were well educated and uh, read Latin and Greek and Hebrew as well. And these are in Hebrew. And uh, these are scarce. They were, they were printed on a large sheet with multiple different ones on it, and you cut them out and stuck them on. But very few survived today. So, other hot topics in the Victorian times with anti-slavery and temperance. Although well, slavery was abolished in Britain by that time, but this one is poking at the Americans to say you're lagging behind. It says you still don't allow marriage with slaves and you know, get on and sort stuff out. Quite a scarce one I'm covering. This one is a anti-temperance, is a temperance, and obviously very much like the John Calvin in Scotland, you shan't enjoy yourself, so no drink or Anything, anything you enjoy. Not quite like that because drink was a bad problem in Victorian times. And as a lot of these uh, can be found on cover. And a very interesting anti Graham movement that uh, was a movement against James Graham, who was a Home Office man at the time. The background to this was that the British government suspected that an Italian resident, a Mr. Mancini, and this is his signature here on the front of action, Giuseppe Mancini, was helping to plan a, 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 an uprising in, in, in Italy to try and to get reunification of all the states. And he was in collusion with some Austrian naval officers, believed. So James Graham authorized the post office to open his mail and have a look, and he did. And they found the intelligence and passed it back to Austria and the Naples government, and the uprising was quashed. But it created a huge fuss. And Punch, of course, was the, uh, the very cynical private eye of the day. And it did create a set of labels, anti punch labels. Now, there are eight of them. There's two of them in the darkest green. These are reprints that were produced like in the 1920s, but that's the original ones. So the, the punch campaign was quite vicious. I mean, the press at, at that time was much more vicious than the press. Now we think ours are pretty bad at the moment, but the punch went to town. And this chap here, Duncombe, was appointed by the, by the parliament to investigate Graham's uh, opening of the mail 
And here's a cartoon of uh, James Graham holding up Dunstan with a piece of mail, uh, trying to stop him doing that. And here's one of James Graham instructing his postman how to open the mail. You open the mail, unpeel the seal, have a look inside, stick it back again, stick another seal on and go. So very naughty thing to do. Uh, just for completeness, there's a couple of envelopes with Duncan's signature and James Graham's signature. Well, that fuss did result in a ban on the government opening mail in Great Britain. But interestingly enough, they didn't pass a law, so it was still legal for them to do it, but they weren't supposed to do it. So it didn't actually get as far as a complete legal ban on it. But they did prompt uh, the introduction of more security for mail. And what came to pass was these uh, metal seals. And they were designed to have one stud on one flap and this circular or shaped seal on the other flap with a hole in it. And when you sealed the envelope and pushed it into that, then the little seal clicked into the metal part of the other part. So it was firmly done. So you would know if someone had tried to open this one. With envelopes with or, or entires with a seal on it, you could soak off the seal a bit and then stick it back on again. But these showed, would really show if you'd opened it. A few banks used it because that's understandable given the security of information that was in it. But this is an envelope I really like. It's a nice piece of postal history too. A hand carried envelope, addressed care of the British Consul in Barraquinilla, New Granada, to be forwarded to the other address on it and by the, 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 the brig Winthrop, which is a ship. And on the back of it, you'll see a forwarding agent's cache in New York, delivering it into hopefully to its final destination. There's no date on it, but this cache was in use from 1852 to 59. And searching through the records of ships docking in New York, we found, I found two for this brig in the period in question. Only one would have been correct because one came from New Granada to New York, but one came from Cartagena and Spain to New York. So that's obviously the, the boat, the ship that carried it on it. But I think mail to New Granada at that time must be quite scarce. This is a very nice item. And because it's consular mail effectively, that's why we use security. Now we move on to another angle on getting the mail uh, easier to use and better to use. And this is a development of eventually folded self-sealing envelopes, but initially patent envelopes. <clears throat> and it's an interesting topic. There were envelopes before these patent envelopes, but the real push to do them properly and the registered designs came in 1840. And Turk was the first one in 1840, 29th of May, he registered his design in number 318 in the register, Henry Tuck. And that's what the envelope looks like. And his idea was that the postage stamp would be put on the flap at the side to seal the envelope, as well as bring the postage. That idea is not unique because in the Treasury competition of 1839, some of the essays put in had that intention to pay postage and seal the envelope. One or two of them did that as their intention. There's a survey of these done, and I can't remember the name of the authors, but the book on um, Maltese Cost Cancellations by Jackson and Rockoff, I think it is. They have an appendix that lists these out, these envelopes. And they listed, I think, a few there. And there's a couple later in the article I found, and I've got my examples. And of the total, three of these ones we use ones on the one. And this one with a different imprint. There's two used ones known, and only one of these used a smaller one. You can see there's two different imprints there. One manufactured by machinery, one matrified by Mr. Riviera and Hackney. Uh, these ones don't use stamps to seal them. They've actually put wafer seals and the stamps on the other side, but they, they are the patent envelopes. And if we note the registration number 318 on the next slide, we find the record in the Board of Trade 
designs held by the British Library. I managed to find this record. 318. And here's a, an envelope with a penny black on it. Pretty scrubby one. The difference here is that the flap is slightly different, but that's neither here nor there, because the principle of the registration of the patent was that it did to seal the envelope across the flap. It's another one, slightly later than Tux, which is Ponsford's patent envelope. I should have said that this one here, it talks about an improved stamp envelope, whereas the press releases about this one talked about a hermetic envelope. It's quite important to remember that just now. The next one was Ponsford, who, who's a bit later in 1840. Same imprint, same manufacturer as Tux envelope. And if you look at the record in the Board of Trade Register, it talks about improved hermetic envelope, whereas Tuck talked about an improved envelope. So I wonder if he's stolen that uh, title hermetic as part of his patent, or perhaps in collaboration. When you look at the actual point in detail, it's pretty unimpressive. He didn't have much to say, it was just an envelope he put on, it looked pretty normal to me. So what was the improvement on this one, really? It was, maybe it was just the name he was trying to, to patent, perhaps. Interesting thing still to be found as he delved through these records. Yes, another patent envelope, quite unusual. Um, and this is a, for, the, for a pattern post, which is samples, sending samples through the post. Got a large envelope with two flaps, one here, one there, both gummed. So you put your sample into between the flaps, close the flaps over, gum them, gum them, stick together, bring down this flap and that flap, and put a thread or or a piece of tape through the holes and tie it. You couldn't seal it because pattern post items had to be open for inspection. Now, this is quite a late usage in 1871 because it was, it was drawn in October 1871. Quite a nice uh, patent envelope. Another one, a recent acquisition, was uh, a Delarue patent envelope. And it its claim to fame was that it had perforations curved around part of the flap. So you could open it by tearing the perforations and preserve the flap, which is nice because that's a very nice cameo of uh, Queen Victoria there. And here's a record from the Board of Trade Records which shows the envelope and the description of the patent. Still on the subject of envelopes, uh, at the 1851 exhibition, there were quite a number of uh, stands of people touting their wares of uh, writing paper or envelopes. And amongst them, uh, Joseph Mansell, who was quite a famous uh, printer and embossing specialist and manufacturer of Valentines. And he produced this box, and that's the, the lid of the box. And I have the rest of the box, the carcass as well. And inside it, were examples of this uh, lace paper envelopes and lace paper writing. And there's the Crystal Palace design on the front, and that would be used on his stand to try and promote his wares. Also, this envelope, I believe, was also at the 1851 exhibition given its design. It's also by Mansell, because the motif on it was a beehive, and that's synonymous with industry. So it fits the 1851 exhibition. Can't prove that, but I'm pretty sure it did go with the exhibition. Still on the exhibition. Uh, at the exhibition, there were two machines they demonstrated, one by Delarue, one by Waterloo, for feeding, folding, cutting, and gumming envelopes automatically. And they could do a few thousand an hour, two, two, two or three thousand an hour. So these were commercially available in quantity. So that made letter writing and sending to the post much easier. Uh, here's an example of an envelope Waterloo produced just before the exhibition, 1850, with all the details on here. Seeing this one, it's showing the new design, which will, which will take away the need for wafers or sealing the envelope with wax. So that's the intention of all of these things at the end game to get to that point. 
just to show that, that that's a season ticket for the exhibition. A little chap here is a, I think he was a surgeon, and a, a, the, the, the person on there, I have the details with it. But he might have seen that machine. And finally, the outcome of the 1851 exhibition was a waterlow printed envelopes at the exhibition with embossing around the flap, saying this was manufactured at the Crystal Palace Hyde Park. And there's another one, I've seen another one advertised, but this is only the second one I've seen. But that conclusion was a result of the way for sales initially, then coming through patent envelopes and then getting to this final game. The final game was the Penny Black, of course. It wasn't the way for sale that won the day for selling the envelope and paying postage. Way for sales did survive, but they survived as poster stamps. And they were in use well into the 20th century, very popular for advertising. But what might have been, because in, in, in the treasury competition, people like Bogardus at this entry, this is a reprint, not the original, the original has not been found. You can't see it, but there's a queen's head in the center. He entered that and won one of the prizes, one of the few prizes, but he made a mistake because he patented his design. And no way was the post office going to take that design because they'd be held over a barrel for years. But another interesting thing is this, I found this letter not that long ago, which is an entire, with a seal on the reverse from the sender, who was a chemist, and he was sending a letter to Germany to buy some cologne from Cologne, funnily enough. And it's got a parody of Whiting's design, which is one of the, uh, the prize winning uh, entries in the treasure exhibition to make it work. So that's what it would have looked like had the wafer seal won the day and become the ceiling and putting the, paying for the postage. So that's the story of uh, the wafer seals and helping the 1839 uh, improvements and I hope you found something of interest. Let's see if we've had some questions because I think we have. Well actually what I've got here for you Stuart is um, some information actually. Uh, oh good. Our, our member Abhishek Bawalka who lives in India he tells us uh, with regard to the wax seals that you mentioned the wax seals on letters from and to the East and West Indies would melt in the warm climates. Oh yes. Causing the back of one entire to oh, stick to the front of another. Hmm. So in 1840, the British Post Office issued a notice asking that the public in the respective countries should be advised to use wafers and not wax while sealing their letters. And he, he's, he says that there are some damaged letters, obviously, that exist where one can see the damage caused to the front of an entire when effort was taken to separate the letters. So that was an interesting consequence, wasn't it, of having the, the, the use of wax? Very interesting, yes. Thank you for that comment. Now, at the moment, nobody has asked a question of you. So, so I'll, I'm happy to make some comments. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, of course Art we Crow. can, Arthur. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a fabulous job. I mean, it, it, Stuart is obviously in the right place to get some really beautiful items. That uh, that uh, Queen Victoria um, patent is spectacular, and uh, I appreciate your uh, putting this out there and letting people really see it and and understand the importance of the of, of sealing that envelope. People really wanted security for their information. And uh, and that's where that's the that's the uh, cross into the into philatelic world where I call powerful Adelie, and uh, fabulous job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art. Thank you for your comment, you. Arthur. Now I have now got a question for you, Stuart. Whilst um, Arthur was speaking, we uh, Winston Williams um, has said that you showed an 1840 envelope with advertising saying manufactured. He, um, Winston thought that no envelopes were manufactured until later. So what, what has he misunderstood? Can, can you maybe enlighten him a bit about um, about the manufacture? 
I think it could be an interpretation of what manufacturing is. You can manufacture them by hand. It doesn't have to be my machine. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so it may have been a, a terminology thing. Okay. Yes, you manufacture them by cutting them up and folding them over by hand. It's not automated. That came in 1850, 1851. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, I think, Mike, that was the only sort of question, uh, along with uh, with Abhishek's comment there and Arthur's remarks, I think that's the only kind of uh, questions we've had. So I'd like to hand back to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you, Stuart. Well, that was a really refreshing talk, very refreshing talk on a very different subject. Uh, and very interesting to all of us. And we're probably frightened of uh, <coughs> asking any questions because you know so much. Um, and pe probably people are just overwhelmed with it. But it was very, very well illustrated. And you had a very clear structure. And it was so colourful. Um, very, very visual. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, you explained it very well and put it into context. We went from wax seals, wafer seals, uh, paper seals, false seals. We've been from Great Britain to Italy, Germany and the U US. And topic wise, we've covered people, places, religion, anti-slavery, corn laws, anti-Graham movement. And then latterly, you've gone on to examples of the Tux patent envelopes and Ponsford patent envelopes and uh, covered the 1851 exhibition. So overall, a superb presentation. Thank you, Stuart. And with that, I'll hand over to our president for the presentation of a virtual certificate. Peter. <laughs> Thank you for your kind remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, Stuart, I, 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 I endorse everything that's been said um, about your show. It's really fascinating stuff. And, um, of course, one thing which crossed my mind is that um, while I'm uh, looking at, uh, uh, at some of my covers um, from as late as the 18, from, from as late as the 1940s, um, so many of the covers from Asia are still sealed with the postage stamp. Mm. Um, which makes um, it quite difficult to find envelopes which you can show uh, in, in exhibits because the stamps are on the wrong side. Uh, and that was a point that you made about uh, the, the early um, use of penny blacks to seal them. So uh, that's a minor detail. But thank you very, very much indeed for a terrific show. It's been a great joy this afternoon. It's really relieved us of a lot of, a lot of pressure. And we all enjoyed it very much. Stuart, it's my pleasure to um, present you with a um, virtual certificate. Um, I can assure you it's quite genuine. It's signed by me and it will be on its way by mail soon. But the presentation, just so that you can see it, it will now be put up by Mark Bailey. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I enjoyed doing it. There we go. 5th of April. So it's a new tax year tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we can all look forward to that. Now, th there is one other thing that I wanted to um, uh, draw your attention to, ladies and gentlemen, and that is that um, uh, Mike earlier on um, made a most appropriate um mention of, of Frank Walton's passing. And uh, we had a moment or two when we could um, pause for thought. Uh, what a lovely thing to do. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we have a condolence um, message uh, on our website. Uh, we put that up a couple of days ago. Um, in, in reply to my um, announcement, um, I've had about 150 emails from all around the world, and there are a large number of people um, using this condolence sheet to uh, write something, some happy memory uh, of, of Frank, which will eventually be bound up and be given to the family. 
So, uh, Mark, if you'd just like to show us where that is, I think that would also be helpful. I will do that, Peter, of course. OK, so you can all see that. It tells me on my screen. You see that I've navigated to the news events and meetings page from the home page. And here is the um, is the notice that Peter just mentioned. And there is a link here, which when you click, takes you to that page, where, as you see, you may add your own condolence message to that page. You can see below that there are an, uh, a number of people have done that already. You can see the, the starts of some of their messages there. So that's that's how you can do that. Um, that was what we put up on the society's website. And as you know, the news events and meetings page is open to everybody. <coughs> you don't have to log in. You notice I'm not logged in here. You, you may go to that page and simply click on that link. Right, thank, thank, you. thank you very much indeed, Mark. <laughs> And uh, finally, from me, um, I would like to advertise the meeting on Thursday um, in London, which is by um, Dr. Peter Young, who is giving the Sir Daniel Cooper lecture. Um, and he will be lecturing at 4.30 p.m. Please note that because there are, there are some um, papers around with five o'clock on it, but it's, it's going to start at 4.30 um, at 15 Abchurch Lane. And um, it will be on uh, YouTube, I think, Mark, um, for others to um, zoom, uh, not zoom into, but to, to listen into. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking about Delaru and colour, um, which is a fascinating subject and something which I'm sure you'll maybe aware uh, he's written a book about. Um, and and, and uh, it's a very good book indeed. So just draw your attention to that Thursday, 4.30 p.m. at Abchurch Lane and on uh, YouTube. But that's all from me. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed. Stuart, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone who's made today possible. And uh, a, a great and really enjoyable afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Could I just um, ask Chris King to unmute his microphone, please, Chris? because we have one question that came into the chat was directed at you rather than at Stuart. Um, Chris, the question comes from our friend Len Stanway, who asks, will any of the Crawford Festival be recorded and or broadcast? Um, we haven't decided yet. Um, we have talked about the possibility. Um, let's wait until we get our speakers lined up and then we'll see what we can do. Um, certainly some of the speaking certainly some of the contributions might make for a good recording so thanks for that suggestion len thanks chris can i say thank you Stuart, as well um i've, I've got a very small collection of wafer seals by comparison with yours <laughs> and uh Mine are mostly political from the peace movement in, in Victorian times, but it's a wonderful subject. And we saw your exhibit again uh, in Budapest over the past few days. Well, what I like about it best, apart from its attraction and its beauty, is the way in which it really puzzles the jury. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to stop recording now.